Welcome to Roadot Team webinar number five. In the first four episodes, uh, we've spoken to coaches from uh, a number of different countries uh, and gained some insights into their approaches to all things rowing. So today we're going to take a slightly different approach and we're actually going to speak to a biomechanist, uh, Connie Draper, who will give us some insights into what's actually happening at a more granular level inside the boat and then we'll actually try to reconcile what coaches see and say with what uh, the biomechanics are actually telling us as well. So first of all, welcome Connie. Thank you, hello. I hope you're very well. Okay, so Connie has a PhD in uh, biomechanics and worked at uh, the AIS, Connie? Yes, I did work uh, from 96 uh, until 98 on the AIS. Then I moved over to Sydney and worked there for four years at the New South Wales Institute of Sport, mainly with rowing, but also with other sports such as slalom, sprint canoeing, and then you know, a bit of swimming, diving. Um, and then we had a four year stint over in Europe, in Switzerland, where I was finishing my PhD. And then back to Australia and then went back to end with again and to Australia, uh, to the AIS again in Canberra, where we stayed until 2013. And then we went back to Switzerland and that's when I started um, to take sort of a more global approach. I started to work um, with a lot of people, clubs, universities, different federations who were interested to work with me in the area of rowing biomechanics. So, and over that time then you've had the opportunity to gain a lot of insight, collect an awful lot of data and as time goes on, that data grows richer and richer. It gives a better insight into all the differences that we see, not just at the, at the top level, but right across the spectrum of rowing. Correct. I think I had a, a fantastic start of my career when I had that chance to work straight away at the AIS um, and with uh, rowing, where I had access to fantastic coaches. Um, some of them we, you spoke to already, like Tim McLaren and all, Paul Thompson. And so for the first, um, you know, uh, 15 years, I pretty much just worked with one nation in rowing. I did work with other sports, but particularly just with really one rowing program. Once I started to consult within rowing biomechanics, suddenly I had access to, you know, different level of skill developments within rowing from, you know, juniors, club up to elite, but also to different uh, beliefs of how can coaching influence rowing and rowing performance. And suddenly it opened up your eyes in the way of finding that you can have different styles of coaching, but the times can be within one second. And I think that's a fascinating part I love to work with. Hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It, it still fascinates me that you can do so much training and then you go out and you race for six minutes and it can be down to fractions of seconds uh, difference and where that actually comes from and, and how we as coaches even begin to to think and, uh, and address that. And that's what we're looking to get into a little bit deeper. So we've broken down this session into a few different areas. And the first one is the integration of uh, biomechanics into coaching, then actually taking a look at some of the, the skill differences between men and women and across different examples and some university crews, just going back to what Connie said there about having the opportunity to see so many different uh, levels of rowing across the years. Then coaching style. So, and I know given that we've spoken to some of the coaches already, this discussion around what you see, particularly at low rate, and then what's actually happening at high rate, the differences between those. Is, is it a style difference or is there something functionally different going on uh, with the speed of the boat? And then a little bit about injury and prevention. 
Yeah, so thanks again. I mean, it was fantastic for me to see your first four webinars with the coaches and um, with a few of them I've worked already. And um, it's always interesting to hear the same topic. Um, you know, also hear what modern coaching is really about. And when we think about it, all coaches mentioned the way how they used to coach, how they are coaching currently, and it always came up. They are using quite a big team, like as a support staff underneath them, who work integratively to support their training and racing to really get the best performances out of the athletes. So when we, even though we only talk about, you know, biomechanics as such today here, I always feel like it is just one little part of the entire puzzle, you know, where obviously the coaches and the, the athletes are the center. And, uh, you know, it's really, um, coach uh, uh, athlete centered and coach driven and then underneath you need the support of areas like biomechanics more so physiotherapy strength and conditioning we need to understand the fitness of the athletes the you know filling the the engine the motor through nutrition um, so all these areas obviously flow quite nicely together here it's um it's not just a one dimensional uh, theme, it's really that support team underneath that can uh, help that modern coaching. And I just chose a, t a little picture there of the coaching and we see already, you know, everyone uses a megaphone and the, um, their stopwatches, but more so we become now that modern coaches who take iPads and tablets into the boat to maybe see real-time feedback straight away on the water, let it be of their heart rates or, um, you know, their force profiles, their speeds. So it's quite interesting how coaches try to modernize their, their eye and objectify their coaching eye, but we still need to be careful that the information you see in the boat is not overwhelming for the coach as well. So it's uh, quite interesting in a way that we find methods to support the coaches in this way. So, and that always brings me to the point, what is actually coaches, uh, coaching versus, you know, taking any measurements. So um, in biomechanics, we love to say we are the objective eye of the coach. And this is just because, you know, we take some measures, we take some numbers or we can display um, visuals uh, into graphs. So what the coaches see as a rowing movement or a rowing stroke, we would in this case maybe measure the forces on their gates or handles and we measure their stroke lengths and display it in a force profile type. So we put something objective as a trace over that movement pattern the coach sees with his eye. And then through his experience, obviously he can adjust his eye to that objective information. And this information then obviously he can take into the uh, training to communicate with the athlete when can focus more on areas where the athletes can make differences to improve in the end uh, technique and then so speed hopefully and both okay. performance so oh. connie just going back to that previous yep. one and because we're already just starting to if you like show some data uh, and we're in this particular case we're looking at a force trace from the catch to the finish so from the left on the, the catch to yeah. the finish on the right hand side and that tail that we actually see at the finish is where the force on the gate actually goes the other way goes negative as such so explain that the spoon is still in the water or it's actually in the act of being taken out of the water and then pushing the hands away so yeah, it's releasing now and we see that there is a bit of a negative force, which means it's that little bit of washing out. 
and that is measured as negative force because it uh, there is water hitting the back of the blade so this okay. is what you know is sort of then the washing out of the blade so we try to keep that as small as possible which is uh, for the athlete if we would look at the the sort of posture of the athlete we have to make sure that the athlete sits as strong as possible around that finish position and obviously you know holds uh, the handle height properly yeah and looking again at that graph looking across the the x-axis uh the x or the, the the magnitude of y the zero isn't actually on that bottom line it's the first line up so we've been seeing a positive force as you've gone through the stroke and yet so the point at which you're sitting now is the point of zero force so mm -hmm. you had force against the gate uh, when you're levering the boat and now you actually have force the other way against the gate while the oar is in the water and you're trying to take it out and then as you push your hands away you still have a little bit of negative and it takes quite a long way you're almost at three quarters slide before you start to see it go neutral again is that correct uh, that's correct um but that's also you know obviously there is a we measure in this particular system i'm using um we measure the force on the gate when you use a look at other systems they measure the force on the handle so there will always be a little negligible force around the gate during the recovery um, but uh, what we are mostly interested is when that positive force is coming back onto the gate um, so we can actually see when our athletes start to um, initiate force and apply force throughout that drive phase but as okay. you said coming towards the finish we obviously need to look very carefully how our athlete is capable of releasing the blade. Super. And the other thing we do have to say is in most cases, we only look at gate forces. It gives us to 90 plus percent really good correlation of the um, the, uh, the correlation to the boat speed and how we can accelerate the boat hull. However, we all know that is also highly important to consider what's happening on the foot stretchers forces. And we could even say what's happening on the seat with the seat loading. But these are measures that are not that easily to take and to measure. Um, so in most cases, we are used to interpret our athletes performance um, on the gate forces or the handle forces for me again as i said important is that you know we can on the positive side provide information to the coaches you know by measuring information however we also have to make sure that what we measure is actually correct because the worst thing is when you take objective measures is if they are not correct that you could actually give false information to coaches and then to athletes, and that could actually um, slow down their um, you know, training and their skill development. So that's always one of my biggest rules that before I hand out information that I actually check that the information I gathered is correct and the boat was set up correctly and calibrated correctly. Yeah, so that's always the thing. The more data we can receive, make sure you actually do the quality control before talking to athletes about what you've seen. So again, um, I guess what we do in our heads and then obviously um, you as a coach and then on the other hand, also we when we use you know, the science to support the coaching is um, that the actual movement yeah has always these three phases where we want to see what is you know how does that rowing stroke appear so we look at the visual obviously or we look at the information then obviously we see something we could correct or we want to uh, improve we see the strengths or area of opportunities where athletes can make a difference so we 
can correct then something and um, talk to the athlete. But the important thing is we need to understand what the cause is. Why, for example, the rowing profile has shown some discrepancies within the rowing application through the stroke. So if I understand the cause, it's much easier for you as the coach to then communicate with the athletes where they can start to fix it. You know, as an individual, maybe in the way how they need to change technique slightly, um, or as a crew, you know, working on timing, on rhythm. So the area, uh, whatever we are doing in our learning process is always of how does movement appear, understanding the cause and understanding how we can correct it. And so we, the circle is an ongoing learning process towards improving performance then. So, and this then brings us then also to the, to the goals of what we are actually doing in coaching or learning anyway. And this is, I mean, in our case, you know, we are training towards racing. So in, in most racing, we are looking into 2000 meter races, but obviously there are different distances when you look into Henley or the Boston races and uh, all the junior races. So, but in all the racing we do within rowing as a strength endurance sport, there always is not just the technical component of our athletes. We always need to understand also, you know, the fitness level of our athlete, how is their mental strength in training, but also in racing. And can we do something tactical, which in strength endurance sports is, you know, we talk about it, but not as much as you would talk about it in team sports, yeah, for example, where that is much more relevant. But when we look, for example, at a race profile for rowing over a 2000 meter race, then you can see here, a two traces on the top graph, which is uh, in red, the rowing, uh, the stroke rate over a 50 meter increment, and the blue line is the boat speed. So what we all um, expect is that with an drop in stroke rate, also the speed comes down. Obviously, at the start, we expect the highest speeds. When we stay in the mid race steady with our rate, speed should be the same. And when we increase rate, we expect an increase in speed. This is sort of something coaches can get now quite easily um, from their racing, uh, from all the um, stroke coaches, the athletes use and the coaches so they can download this or during FISA racing, you can get all the information of all competitors these days as well. Um, but when we use a bit more information about our athletes during racing, then it becomes quite interesting. So we see here uh, the same information of the same race, but now I use a different system the system where I can also measure the power outputs of the athlete. So the stroke rate is in the other system still the same color, also in red. But now what I include is the, the power on a stroke by stroke basis for that crew. In this case, it's a men's squad. It's a medal winning boat. Um, in world championships and uh, Olympic games. So, um, but and the interesting thing is here, so when we said, so we expect that stroke rate, speed, and also crew power should pretty much, the traces should pretty much run parallel, then we can see that this is the case for that particular boat. So this is sort of a successful racing profile what we are looking for. However, when you now look at these four lines underneath, that displays the, you know, that sort of performance level and their racing strategy of the four athletes during a race. And now you see here, 
I displayed for the seeds of the quad four, three, two, one, the different color. And you can clearly see that one line is very different to the other three. So when we look at um, the three lines that are pretty close together, then you see here three athletes have very strong start, so their power output's quite high, and they are all have a very small variety of their power outputs on a stroke by stroke basis. And with the last bit of the increase of the stroke rate, also their power comes up. But in comparison to the athlete in two seat in the red color, you can see a completely different profile. Getting out of the start is okay, but not as strong as the other three athletes. In the transition phase, his power is quite a bit down in comparison to the other three. And what we also see, he is very inconsistent in the stroke by stroke um, production. So in a sweep boat, if you think about it, that would be quite um, annoying for the athletes on in the boat because you would constantly have a different amount of power available on one side to the other. Here for the Scala, um, he was quite even on right and left, but he did have quite a high variation of his power outputs, of his total power outputs um, on a stroke by stroke basis. Um, but when you see that person coming into the last 750 meters, it looked like he had a different engine going. So they called him in the crew, he takes them home yeah, in a race. So they knew when he starts the last 750 meters, that was his part of the race where he was responsible. So the interesting discussion here with this crew was really, how could he also look after the first few strokes at the start? He knew that wasn't his best. He was working later towards the international competition on more um, consistent stroke by stroke power delivery. But one thing was clear, nobody really wanted to take that last bit of his racing strategy away because this where he was psychologically super strong. So on the other hand, when you see here, these different profiles, sometimes coaches ask, shouldn't you have four athletes that have very similar racing styles? And I often say, mm, not necessarily, because if you see here their crew boat power, yeah, the average of these four, mm -hmm. it does has that successful trace of what we see versus their speed and their power you also see that they can rely on each other. So it's not, if we would have four doing exactly the same, then it's actually sometimes quite fragile coming towards the finish when there is nobody who can put in another gear. So it's, for me, it's highly exciting when I have racing information from athletes and from crews and discuss that with coaches, because even though that athlete in red looks initially quite annoying as part of the team in a way of how inconsistent he delivers his power, he brings so much more to the boat, which initially doesn't show up, you know, of what we would look for in training, be consistent, work with your team. Yeah. And, and so, this, this is where the coach has to be pretty smart, really, in, in interpreting and working with a, a biomechanist around this type of data, because it, as you say, at this stage, you've, you've dived in a layer, but actually now you're in, it's not simple biomechanics as in that, in the purest of senses, because it is, it's tactical, it's psychological, it could be physiological even, who, who actually knows, because you don't have, at this moment, we just have force data. And as a coach and as a coaching team, you could sit down to explore, is there anything that physiologically supports this? Is there anything psychologically that supports this? And 
the danger can often be, and I've, I've seen this a number of times, is you can get drawn towards the data and thinking, I've got to fix this. And it doesn't need to be fixed. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, Noel, uh, um, Tim, uh, John, they all talked about it. Yeah. I think it's important to understand the strengths of your athletes, not in one area, in all the areas. What can he deliver in training? What can he deliver in racing? If I understand the strengths of my athletes, that will make the crew so much stronger and putting together the strengths of a crew, it's so much better to actually be clear about the tactics you want to use for your racing style, yeah? Um, and the interesting part then is, if you understand how your athletes are capable of racing, or in the way what you can teach them to get out of them during racing, it also, really brings up that next level of where you can create your racing profile. So you are in charge of your race, you're acting, you're not reacting to your competitors. Yeah. I mean, when we just think of last year's lightweight men's double, yeah, that racing strategy was so different from the others in the race. Yeah. Um, and then the iris just came through. I mean, um, everyone would have thought at the beginning, wow, they are so far back. Are they going to make it? Yeah. But there was something. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, and again, that's that interaction across all this, the four areas that you've mentioned here. You know, you could, a physiologist might make an argument for going, well, you should be more even paced. Um, but a psychologist looks at it at a slightly different level in that the way the sport has evolved people start hard and people finish hard and there's some psychological explanation for why that happens and your body seems to be able to to deliver that yeah and um i mean you know not everyone has these big support teams and it's not necessary because in the end the uh, the coaches they can they know their athletes yeah to uh, to that extent they actually provide all that information. They've got that in their head. But if they have a little bit of objective feedback, yeah, of different stages of training and racing, of course, then your, your database or your experience um, you know about your um, crew is so much, you know, denser and you can actually make the tactical part of the racing so much more so much stronger yeah okay so the message here is understand this is an interaction of a series of things it's not simply okay this is some hard data that i need to fix and i know we'll move on now and it gets even to a to a deeper level mm. yeah i just uh, uh, sort of as the other thing too is why I also wanted to show that data is um, that the important thing is that we don't try to explain this information in one number. You know, I could have also given you the power of all four athletes in the average power per 2000 meters. And yes, that is important for us to look at as well. However, if I want to make tactical changes or if i want to understand my athletes from all these different perspectives it is better to look through you know more continuous data sets of during training as well as during racing yeah so i don't i'm not the believer of just one average data set all the time yeah so that's where i always say to athletes if you have information take a little bit more care of what's continuously coming through. Okay, so um, yeah, so the next bit, um, I just really wanted to, you know, use a chance here to show the coaches of where the differences lie when you work with different uh, um, athletes at different skill levels and in different weight and uh, gender. Uh, categories and i think it's always interesting to look at um that 
graph I put together uh, from the college level here. And these are lightweight women's aids, then open women's aids, lightweight men's aid, heavy men's aid. And I put them all on the same scale for the forces. Yeah, and I had to use the heavy men's um, heavy men's scale mm -hmm. because otherwise it's very hard for you to understand where the differences lie in the magnitude of the capability of applying forces in the different gender and weight categories. And I also kept the same scale for the stroke lengths, um, which I normally don't do. So in sort of the science, we always say to get the best resolution to look into explaining force um, applications of our athletes, we should always try to fill out the graphs to the, you know, to two thirds mm. of the graph. But so even though our lightweight women look a little bit depleted here in comparison to the heavy men, it does show you, of course, what we all know, but it's sometimes interesting to see it, you know, in sort of these objective views. So what we know is lightweight women, of course, would grow shorter to heavyweight men. Um, we also know that the uh, power applied in any stroke rate um, would be for the lighter women's category, the lowest and for the heavy men, the highest. But what's also important to understand is that it takes women longer to reach their peak forces than it can be with men. So we can really say stroke lengths increases with, um, with weight and gender. The um, magnitude of peak forces increases. The total average force per stroke increases the same as the work and of course the power of per stroke. And lastly, what is um, very interesting obviously between um, female and male crews is that the variety of force application in the younger females is um, the force applications is uh, much wider because the upper body strength in women is so much weaker in comparison to the men. Yeah, men can, their rate of force development is greater so they can combine the legs and body a bit longer together. So we get this um, more uniform force profiles in the men's group, in the women is much um, wider there. So when you compare that then in skill development, and I start off with the men here, so then you see boys crews. And what I did is I chose um, just four, um, four profiles in this case here, it's a coxed four, then um, a collegiate uh, eight, but I only took four profiles out, so we see a little bit, and then the from a national team also a four. So what changes, you know, when you start off as a beginner, then making it to the top of the pyramid? And obviously, um, you see same thing of what we said before. Um, with an in, uh, improvement in your skill level, obviously the power increases, your magnitude of peak force and average force becomes greater, um, but also your force of, um, your rate of force development becomes uh, steeper and greater. Um, why that is, is obviously the skill level of preparation towards the catch becomes, has to become better getting up towards the top level. Um, so when we look at the, the uh, catch slip at the beginner's level and the finish slip, you see that our athletes doing very similar stroke lengths of 88 to 90 degrees already in the junior level, the boys, 
but they lose so much more uh, distance where the blade is just moving without having any load um, on the blade versus when we come onto the top level then we can have athletes that pretty much have zero slip of the catch at the high rate where they come towards the catch and pretty much the blade is in and loaded so the coordination of blade placement to leg push is of course super defined in the top level end versus the beginners and this is often where um, you also see the differences between successful crews to less successful crews yeah getting the coordination and that fine skills right of how to move um, when you look into the women then you see that um, same effect the the stroke length is not really what is so much difference it's the effective length that gets greater with the increase or the the higher level when you go towards the national team but what is very obvious with uh, young women and females um, is that they create in the beginners and club level more a triangle shape so even though we try to use body swing a lot with the girls you can actually see that they are not capable of really building and holding the top 30 percent of peak force through the mid drive yeah that and this is just only one crew as an example but i can tell you that we see that a lot in this area you see once you come into the collegiate and the national level obviously the athletes get much more work done per stroke so more area under the curve and it's more a round force profile versus a triangular profile yeah yeah, yeah. and you and i over the years have, have sat and, and looked at quite a few of, of these different curves and one thing you, again if people tend to be drawn towards the data and they think okay well we would make all these the same or what's an ideal curve you you begin to understand that for an athlete to actually change this is quite a long process it it almost becomes a little bit like a fingerprint yeah our athletes definitely have a fingerprint from the very early age and um, it's very hard to change that um, it's also sort of our neuromuscular pattern we you know get given uh, genetically so there are people who have more fast twitch muscles who often you know can um, create a quicker um, rate of force development earlier in the stroke and then you have some people who maybe never reach such a high peak force as others for example here but they can or maybe here in the national level the person in red um, but they can really work throughout the entire stroke yeah or drive phase so that's why i always point out to coaches um, not just look at one component you know like don't make the peak force your main component as for to judge if your athlete is strong enough to be in your crew or not because you really need to look at different ways of how effective is your athlete and is the seat you have them in the most appropriate for their style of rowing yeah and, yeah. and that does do you want to make any comment on seats um yeah I, I, people like to you know to talk about it and of course it's exciting you know when you uh, look into profiles um, sometimes it works um, sort of just using the biomechanical method for it um, so in general if we see good connection from profiles um, of the catch so if you look at that person here in in that blue purple color in the collegiate rowing level 
uh, you see there is quite a quick rate of force development with a higher peak force and then the force comes off in the second half. These are often athletes that tend to be really good in the sort of stern part of the boat um, because they get quite a good leg drive done. Also, we see that the people who do that with the legs and then bringing the body, they often have used up a lot of body naturally already uh, in the two thirds of the stroke. So their end of the stroke is, is not as strong. And um, so they wouldn't be as good in, you know, being a bow person. But for example, the person here in the red profile would be quite a good bow person because they have a really good strong bow end of drive. Mm -hmm. And um, they can really um, sort of set the rhythm well and finish the stroke of well for the crew. So if we have more rate of force development, often these athletes end up naturally towards the stern. People that are more working through the stroke often look like they are mostly um, successful and beneficial for a crew towards the bow. Okay. So, and much of what you're describing <laughs> there, in their, in their own way, coaches would actually figure this out intuitively as a coach as well as you look at your crews and you do small boats and you do big boats you begin to recognize where people sit what you're actually demonstrating here or what you're explaining here is the why in effect it's it's the invisible piece of why that's working yeah i would actually um um say that uh, in general I would say 95% of the coaches would choose the seats naturally where I also would see where we would put the athletes. I had to learn quite a bit. Once I came into that college system, um, it was quite interesting for me to see how often they change athletes in different seats. And that was for me quite interesting because first I questioned, why would you do that? But then I also realized that um, they wanted to understand the athletes to feel each seat and understand what each seat needs, yeah, what the role is of each seat. So that became quite an interesting little uh, project for me to actually see where what these athletes can provide in different seats and where they end up in the entering racing. So. When they came towards the end, we matched up with our ideas in most cases anyway. But if I come in during training sessions sometimes, in testing sessions, of course I would say to a coach, mm, I don't understand why you have a person in that particular seat right now. And then the coach would smile at me and say, yes, Connie, but that's not where he's going to end up, I think. So um, in most cases, it matches already what the coach is seeing. Um, and then obviously some data can underline where the strength of each athlete is because if you have a group of 50 athletes it's always hard to know each athlete you know um, mm -hmm. down to their you know personal strength okay so i have a question here uh, connie that's just come in from paul regarding the curve profile what kind of a curve we need to find for men and then a follow on to that with women, are we saying that a more rounded curve is better because they reach a higher peak? And is boat type a matter in this issue as well? Okay, going back to men, to create most power, the, the, the best possible power in, for your athlete is obviously to get the most area under the curve. That would be a square, but of course that's hard to do. Um, and then to understand you know, what would be the best for male rowing. Um, as we said, is uh, you will get athletes who have a very steep rate of force development here. And th there will be other curves that come up in a minute. 
Um, so with men, you know, we want to have the best possible connection of the catch because what it does is it means the blade is actually in when your strongest muscle groups, the legs, are working. So if I have my blade loaded in the water when my legs start pushing, that is the best possible scenario to create the most power for a per stroke. And then there are obviously differences how you do it in a small boat, like a pair, two and eight. In a faster boat, there is a tendency that you have more athletes are using a more leg driven style yeah to continue the speed of that fast boat when you look into a pair there are often successful boat um, combinations where you have somebody who has quite a steep rate of force development who's mostly sits in the stroke seat high peak force um, and then flattens down in the second half and in the bow you often have somebody who works more steadily through the entire stroke and doesn't really have such a peak force as the person in stroke. So this is just to match the forces um, in that pair scenario where we know that we need to keep the boat straight otherwise if both athletes would do exactly the same then the boat would um, mm. Lose the track. Yeah. With the women, again, um, very similar. So we are not saying we want a particular triangular shape. We actually want more a round shape. But again, depend how you coordinating legs, body, and arms. And um, so, if you have again the best possible connection of the front that will give you a very good um, a possibility to get a great uh, or high rate of force development with the highest possible peak force for the style you are rowing. And then uh, the important thing is how long can I keep my peak force or my top 30% of peak force throughout the drive phase. So this is more what you're looking for. Yeah, so it's more a round shape, but it can be more front driven or more end driven or somebody more driven through the entire um, drive phase. Yeah, so there is not just one style we are looking for, but again, coming from a pair to an eight, it of course becomes a little bit more leg driven towards the, um, the front of the drive. Is that to do with the speed of the boat? Yes, as, uh, yeah, definitely. That's uh, because we need the legs, um, or we need the blade in, and that legs can really connect to keep that speed of the boat up. If we are not connected, or if our legs start pushing before the blades are in, we would create negative force to the boat. And this is what coaches often would call the check time. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if we push before the blade is loaded, <clears throat> then we are pushing the boat backwards or in other ways, we would decelerate the hull longer than necessary. So a boat that's going faster. And if we just categorize them you know, simply, if you say a men's eight is the fa going fastest through the water, then assuming all things being equal and, and the, the athlete gets the oar in, their ability to actually then catch up with the boat, if you like, or to connect their oar to begin to generate some force uh, comes down to the speed that they can engage their legs with. And they have a little bit more time as the boat becomes smaller. Am I interpreting that correctly? Yes, you can do it this way, or you can also add another component there as well. And this is if we are not bringing the, um, the blade into the water early, you know, as early as possible, mm -hmm. the beginning of the drive or at the catch, then what happens is um, it, uh, the angle of your, of your blade becomes 
wider and wider where we sort of bring it into the water and it will um, it will be harder and harder to actually enter the blade and get yes. all that water against the, the frontal area of the blade. So you're stopping it again and that causes then an, that opening up of the body that we want to pretty much um, avoid. Yeah. So it cre if we are not keeping the coordination towards the catch fluidly, what happens then is we are creating a beginning of a stroke that becomes quite reactive and we are interfering the speed of the boat. Yeah, because we are slower than with our uh, blade placement and the leg push than what we would do uh, or what our boat speed would be. So anyway, we have, of course, then, uh, you know, I could show you different, uh, um, a lot of different um, examples, but I think one uh, important question I always get is, we see different styles coaches have been using successfully now internationally. Um, um, sometimes it comes with a federation that teaches a different styles or, um, you know, what you also mentioned in one of the last few webinars, when you mentioned the, the Romanian style or the Italian style, or it can also be more a coaching style that the coach takes, doesn't matter in what country he works. Um, and obviously the big questions came in the last few years and, um, and oops, sorry, this was the, um, can we, what, um, or how is that pausing finish or gathering finish, whatever you want to call it, how does it look differently to a flowing finish around the back or a continuous finish? And uh, I know that uh, John talked about it, um, Tim mentioned it a little bit, and also Noel spoke about it with the um, awesome foursome. And, um, it's quite interesting. So what I uh, did to just show you some evidence of what you actually see objectively versus what you see with your eye is that I want to show you results of two um, world champion crews. And um, when we saw them technically, the two lightweight men's four, they looked fantastic in the years they were the world champion and uh, medal winners in, in the Olympics. Um, and what you see here is, and I want to start off with their racing profile. They are just doing, I had data of them of 250 meter stroke rate um, uh, of the race pace. And you can see here one crew did 38 and a half and the other one 39. So there are not many differences when you look at the uh, power they had within these 250 meter pieces, you would say, oh, okay, typical lightweight four, very close, not just in times, but also in power. And then um, we still have that question, what is the difference? And um, as we said also in all you in these webinars, when they are at speed, you actually don't really see a difference. And the area where, or the graph that helps us to understand the different styles is the handle velocity. So everyone mm -hmm. sort of is very familiar with the force angle profile. So you see here the four athletes in these, both, uh, in these two different boats of the different years. And um, one of them, of one of the crews has that style of what you're looking for, you know, that gathering style versus that flowing style. Right now, I don't think you will figure out which one is which because at rate, we don't see any change in the handle velocity. So the way how that graph works is similar to the force angle graph where we say from the catch, uh, you go through the drive phase, you see the force application towards the finish, and then is a return towards, uh, throughout the recovery towards the next catch. Now in the handle velocity, we move the same way around. You can see here 
the minimum points for the four profiles are the, uh, it's the catch position. And now you see going through the angles, you see how their speed goes through, the handle speed goes through the drive phase. So there is, you know, first there, holding it and then accelerating the handle through the dry face towards the finish. And then at the finish, you can see at what speed the handles go tap down, hands away, and then in one fluid speed forward coming towards the next catch. The differences we see here between these four uh, profiles is that there are two athletes who have a shorter catch angle and who have a longer catch angle in that particular crew. When you look at this crew, all four athletes look pretty much the same, not just in their speed, because you see they overlay each other, but also in their stroke length. So yeah. the fluidity around that recovery is exactly the same. Yeah? Yes. So, so we're, the, the conversation that we had in some of these earlier webinars was, was pretty much that, that you might see differences when they're paddling, but actually when they're racing, <laughs> there isn't enough time to really be doing anything different. Everyone is just doing almost the same thing and you almost have to given that you are at 38 39 strokes a minute it is a continuous movement with very little interruption yeah and uh, at that stage too we need to understand the speed the handle speed forward in the recovery is actually faster than the handle speed we have during the drive time yeah so yeah. Um, and you will see now the difference when we go now to pedaling and here is where we see the difference. Um, and you see here, the, again, the drive phase, pretty much the same. Um, the power is here a little lower, four stroke rate, 20, both of them did in this case, I looked for pieces where they did 1000 meter steady state or stroke rate 20. Um, this crew had a lot of work prior to that 1000 meter test. Uh, but importantly now is, do you now see the difference between the gathering finish and the flowing finish? And here you see now that the difference you see is the uh, recovery handle velocity between the two crews. So when we look into that style, you can see that off the back, there is a very slow hands away and this crew is accelerating their handles and body quicker towards the next catch. So yeah. the arrow goes more like that. Yeah. When you look at this style, then you see that there is pretty much the same speed from the bags, tap down, hands away, flowing towards the next catch. And it's one speed. So what looks visually so hugely different to our eye can be seen also at low rate in the handle velocity. We don't see really differences in force profiles or in finishes, uh, in the way they accelerate the handle. That's mm. not the difference. The difference is how you maneuver your handle um, around the finish and what you do with that in, like how you are coordinating then your movement throughout the recovery towards the next catch. And this is a big difference in the way that coaching style or belief is moving or is teaching the athletes to move towards that next catch. And that, there could be any number of reasons that 
a crew or a coach might actually justify to themselves as to why they want to to do it that way. It, it, maybe it's something to do with coordinating timing. Maybe it's something to do with arriving in a certain way. But at the end of it, what we're actually saying is it doesn't really make any difference because when you go to race raids, you all are doing the same thing anyway. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that's, again, it's, um, you know, it's fascinating to see this. Um, also, you know, when people say, yes, the, um, um, the uh, crews that would have a pausing finish have a stronger connection of the back end. But when you look at these two examples, the one with their flowing technique is actually stronger connected through the back end than the one that is using more the gathering finish. So um, it's really about how um, these four in these four athletes or how the crew is moving together with the same style. And what this both of these crews do extremely well is you can see how tight they are moving together. And uh, this is what their, um, the strength was of the crew and why the, their boat speed never really came down. Yeah? So the boat was constantly running smoothly and hardly had any, you couldn't visually actually see much drop in their speed. Um, and this was because they moved like I always say like one bubble, yeah? They, they mirrored each other's movement so beautifully that uh, it felt like there was just one person moving the boat and not four bodies moving. And that made both of these crews so extremely strong uh, during training and then obviously uh, during racing. And that was always so, um, so great to see, yeah? When we looked into good rowing, a lot of um, coaches or people would use them as an example for extremely uh, good rowing in, in the sweep categories for lightweight and also heavyweight, yeah? just to show how crews should move together, feel each other and creating that one pattern and one crew dynamics together. Yeah, one thing that, that I've noticed when we've looked at some of this over the years as well is the consistency from stroke to stroke in a successful crew, the consistency is actually very tight. So whatever it is that they do, they replicate it quite tightly from stroke to stroke. Whereas crews, and from, from, my, from what I've seen in, in looking at some of the data, you don't have to go very far away from the medals and the level of variability from stroke to stroke actually increases quite radically. Yeah. And, um, you know, often we can also, as you say, that can even happen in, in the international level. Um, you know, uh, wind conditions, the moment they change, some, you know, wouldn't like this particular two crews, there wouldn't be a difference, a hugely visible difference for me to see if they would row in sidewind. They just could do it, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, when other crews, they would get out of timing or would get caught around uh, the back and the, and the catches, yeah? And um, one area I'm also interested in is sort of how the boot, boat moves, you know, uh, how it rotates and what the roll and yaw does within the uh, rowing stroke. So um, again, these crews knew how the balance of their boat was and it was never really changing on a stroke by stroke basis. But with a lot of crews, especially young crews, you would see a lot of timing differences already off the catch because the blades are at different heights, but not just that. Also the boat is not every time at the same spot. So you cannot actually anticipate how far your blade has to go into the water because the boat could constantly be at a different level. Yeah. When they yeah. come to the position of placing or releasing the blade. Yeah. So with, and, and this gets a lot of air time, this 
difference in style that we see when people are, are paddling and, and I guess unfortunately that's when we see people most uh, you know in an international boat park or wherever um, because 85 90 90 plus percent of our of our training is actually done at the stroke rate so for a coach be very clear on the choice you make and why you're making it and acknowledge that in the end it doesn't actually impact what's happening at a higher rate you're making that choice for for some purpose, whether it might be a better finish or a better catch or developing timing together, whatever it actually happens to be, you have to have some rationale in your own mind why you would make that choice. I think um, what people need to understand is that that pausing and gathering finish is not just, the, or people who do that successfully are not just doing that on the water the entire off-water programming strength and conditioning is based around the technique as well because as john keogh pointed out in the webinar before um, it takes a lot of strength to also hold that finished position and our developing athletes often don't have that skill level or if athletes um, row a lot on the ergometer and often get also based on the ergometer scores in what crew they are. Um, you know that the ergometer style is definitely not um, suiting our on water style because with these long finishes or the handle can come up, that would be totally um, working against what you would try with that type of style yeah um, you have to create quite a strong upper body and core to be actually able to row that style well yeah so it's not just something that you can create in a few weeks and also then the timing coming forward of course is something um you know you especially with the young athletes just i just wanted to point that out is that falling into the catch what often athletes do because they want to show you they can row long um, that would again work against of what you try to achieve to keep that boat speed moving yeah so yeah that brings us on to that next piece of perhaps one of the areas where and i've certainly valued this biomechanics helps quite a lot is around the angles Coming with the angles again, and this is another example which I um, see a lot, but also love to show to to coaches is um, when we come into crew dynamics. You know, how do we create the same look of our athletes? Um, but um, having that typical point of why can my crew roll long at low rate? and then we row so short at the high rate. What I often see uh, with our athletes is the, um, and again, looking at the handle velocity is that it's quite normal that with an increase in rate and that shorter time we have in the recovery of moving from the finish, then back towards the next catch. Um, so if I have less time, to get towards the next catch. That means I um, <clears throat> need to understand how to stay with the speed of the boat in the recovery. So what a lot of our crews actually do is that they row fine because they have enough of time and then move together <clears throat> towards the next catch and can row long when they have time. Once they come into the higher rate, there is quite an interesting uh, Point what a lot of athletes do. They move quite quickly and tap down hands away when they have sort of more the flowy technique. Um, but then they, once they come around that shoulder and coming towards the next catch, they're actually slowing the handle velocity down towards the next catch. And this is quite interesting because what it creates is that we are by slowing down our handle and body, you know, moving around the pin and 
create then a shorter catch angle because I brought my speed down. So the thing what our athletes need to understand is that we need to be able to reach that a longer catch angle and to be effective and ready for the next catch and drive phase is that we need to work on a one speed, one handle speed towards the catch movement. And this would look like that. So it actually takes quite a bit of time to teach athletes that the understanding of having one speed of the back and moving with the speed of the boat coming towards the catch without slowing down the last third of the drive phase. Once the athletes understand how they can continue the initial recovery speed into the second half of the recovery towards the next catch, then they can actually keep their stro uh, their catch angle pretty long and also be quite connected and ready for the next catch and dry phase. But if we do it in this style, sort of, you know, quick hands away and then slowing down. There is no way that I can keep my stroke length that I was able to have at a lower rate. Um, so this is quite an interesting part to work with the athletes because what we often just do is we say, oh, you are not powerful enough or you row too short. But our athletes do not understand how can I actually get a longer catch or a longer effective catch position to be able to be more powerful? So for me, it's highly important that we take more care in with our recovery and that we take more care in the, with the recovery and our body posture to be ready for the next catch. And that's a highly important point that uh, where we as coaches and athletes can make huge differences to improve um, our athletes' performance. So it's a preparation. So this is almost counterintuitive for athletes in, in some ways because you, you see this a lot in coaching that if they try to achieve longer length, they equate that with I need to take more time to get to the catch or it will take me longer. So therefore the concept of time is to slow down. That's right. If that and makes sense. And in fact, it has the opposite impact because as you slow down, then your timing to the water actually becomes worse because now you have to move, almost move the, the oar to the stern. So actually your angle becomes shorter find that topic highly interesting to discuss with coaches and athletes separately and then together. Because what uh, you need, uh, that's where terminology comes in, is the language and the phrases we use to try to teach our athletes that movement is what I'm saying actually the message that they're receiving or do they hear something Ex or completely different of what you say. So uh, what I often do with um, crews is that, you know, obviously I hear the coach talking in the coach's boat, how he does it. Um, then I see the data and know how the athletes interpret that. And then when we talk to the athletes, I often say to them, can you explain to me how you sort of put the, as, uh, the coach's advice into practice. And that's when you realize how your coaching words and your coaching method actually gets applied into a rowing stroke. And um, I think that's where we can learn a lot in the two-way communication, that the, the phrases and languages we use these days is still not refined enough. I think we need to really speak to the athletes a little bit more to just understand, to find, you know, one common denominator to say, is that what I'm saying? 
is that what you're hearing? Um, and I think this is where the strength of objective data comes in again, because here you see the two different results that are possible. And our athletes have no difference, uh, difficulties of understanding traces to read. That's what they grew up with from the very early age. So this is actually a very important tool for you as a coach and as an athlete to uh, like a communication tool to make sure that you find the correct language for each other. Now, the perspective of the coach and the athlete are, are quite different in that quite often the coach is, is observational. He's observing the system from the outside, whereas the athlete sits in the system. It's a, it's a different experience. I, when I get back in a boat and I think about coaching, almost coaching myself out of what was on the outside, I think sometimes this doesn't make sense. As an athlete sitting in the boat, a lot more of your judgment is based on the interaction of you and the shell moving backwards and forwards together, or you're moving with it or you're moving against it, whereas the coach is actually seeing something else on the outside. And, and that changes the language completely. And I think over the years, that's one of the, the things that's changed most for me in coaching was at the beginning, I was just observing and almost recounting what my observation was, but not using words or terminology that made sense to when you're actually sitting inside the system and you're part of the system. So the last two slides, I just wanted to show you how we also use information, not just as a performance tool, but also for injury prevention. Um, again, I uh, think the way modern coaching is these days, um, and uh, let me start with, with that graph, is um, that you always have you know, uh, the athletes going to get a massage or to physio um, just to make sure that, um, you know, they are well looked after and they are ready for that, you know, very strenuous sport of rowing, um, which is quite hard um, to maintain a good balance. Um, and um, again, so Obviously, in the area where I work, where I take measures of, you know, national teams quite often, then you've got a database of your athletes, you know them, you know their signatures, as you mentioned before. So um, we had one scenario at one stage when um, in 2012, I was testing a crew and I've seen um, the profile in January of that one particular athlete, it looked you know, pretty much the same. We knew what we had to work on at the, around the last third of the drive phase, and you can see it here. Um, but then uh, three months later, there was another test. Uh, I actually couldn't attend, so I only get, got the data. And I noticed a huge drop of force um, on the right hand side in this uh, scholar out of the uh, men's quad and um, this was so different from what I've seen that I you know contacted the coach and I said I need to check my system <laughs> if my uh, force sensor is was working correctly however can you at the same time check if the athlete is okay or if he has noticed anything different. Funnily enough, that person came then um, back to the coach the same day and said, as um, I had to go to the physio uh, because I had um, rib pain and it was diagnosed that the athlete had a um, rib stress fracture. And this just before the Olympics, of course, was devastating initially. Um, that person ended up in the boat, won, won a medal. It was a fantastic story. However, um, again, what we could say is that when you know the signature of your athlete and you see suddenly something a little bit different, then keep in mind that could be signs of athletes being overworked or maybe getting tired or already 
injuries starting to occur, which maybe he doesn't want to point out because he wants to keep rowing, but we need to, uh, it's better, you know, to prevent the injuries than um, letting it continue and then getting a, like a proper break in this case, yeah? So uh, it was, you have not many data sets when you finally actually, that's one of the only data sets we have where we actually know that it was a proper rib stress fracture. Um, but obviously where we use it too is our work, uh, even though I don't work with bond team particularly on a day-by-day -day basis, um, I do love to have a checkup with the physios or the strength and conditioning uh, coaches who work with the team to just make them aware what each of the force profiles look like for athletes. And you can see here the three examples um, because with the different styles they row, they get certain, they, I, I know where their strengths lie, but I also know where their weaknesses are. You know, if somebody opens the body too early or grabs too much uh, with the hands and, and bends the elbow too much. So by showing this information to the support team of the crews, uh, of the coaches, um, you know, the physios and uh, strength and conditioning people, they can then off water um, assist the athletes in their training and doing a bit more functional work around this area or, you know, the physiotherapist work with them actively on these areas to make sure that we strengthen certain parts of the body and take a bit more care of it. Because mm -hmm. as we said before, um, every athlete has a style, but then also every athlete can look pretty much all right in a low rate scenario. But once they go up to high rate, they often then often um, the weaknesses of that rowing profile can become much more obvious. So if we understand this information of each as athlete better, we can be more proactive and the athletes can train at a higher level um, more on a daily basis, yeah? Because mm -hmm. we can be more proactive in supporting the athletes and the particular crews when they row together. Yeah. So yeah. that was pretty much the overview I just wanted to give how biomechanics can be an integral part of, um, you know, any coaching and rowing team mm -hmm. and that would be in other sports the same. So a, a timely question on that, uh, Connie, from uh, Martin Hogan, who I know is in, in Dublin in, in Ireland, uh, asked the question, uh, and I know we're look, what we're looking at here is, is the output from a peach system, which is very much at, at the sort of top end of, of what's available for biomechanics in, in rowing. How difficult or expensive is it for a club or college crew to employ these techniques in terms of tools and equipment, et cetera, asks, uh, you know, Martin. So um, without having to, to go to have this level of equipment, you know, what else is out there that you've seen that might serve a purpose? Although I think also it is worth observing that, yes, some of this equipment seems expensive at the outset, but then again, the investment that people make into boats and oars and so on is, is not necessarily that different. So, you know, I see, for example, a lot more university crews using peach equipment and rowing with it constantly. So yes, it is expensive, but what other alternatives are there, Connie? I mean, obviously there are a few different systems around, you know, there are the NK gates, there's the peach system. So if you look into um, um, the, if you want to look into power profiles, then and force profiles, sort of getting individual data, then there are this, um, you know, NK Peach are the most known one. And Bill Kleshnev has got another system, his uh, BioRow system. Um, mm. But there are also companies coming out with, that maybe don't um, measure forces as such, but they measure with little accelerometers 
um, movement. So you can measure seat speed and handle speed. So you can work on the synchronization of athletes' uh, body movements. So there is a lot of information out there. But sometimes, of course, we know that there are a lot of clubs out there who would say we cannot afford that. And um, and I always say, yeah, it, it's, it's clear and it doesn't matter. But if you have an understanding of what, how our athletes look like, your coach's eye gets more and more sort of educated of what to look for. So if you know how certain profiles look like, then you can start to um, correlate that to what you see visually with your athletes on the water. So you don't necessarily always need to measure every session or you don't need to be worried if you don't have a system. If you develop a good understanding of how objective data looks in for rowing and get your sort of eye sort of combined with the information that's out there, that helps you already to sort of uplift or upgrade your your coaching um, method and your coaching application of how you want to work with your athletes. Yeah, um, in I think in simple terms, you like a Peter Shakespeare would say to me, we used to uh, put a half uh, full water bottle into the boat um, just to hear you know, how the boat is moving and how the check, how the check time is. So if the boat has a sort of very quick movement and you hear a very quick sound, um, mm -hmm. then you know the check time is quite short. So the connection of the front um, is actually not bad, but you hear the water sort of dribbling in through the water bottle, then you know that the coordination of blade placement to leg push is not that good. So, you know, people um, for 100 years have used different sort of very simple tools to try to use their senses of how the boat is running. Yeah, so we don't need to be worried if we don't have, um, if everybody doesn't have the tools available. Um, just use your common sense and use the information that's out there. You know, there are fantastic um, books out there where you get a lot of information. There are a lot of information there from, from um, a lot of conferences that are all online now. And I'm, I'm sure that you will be able to relate a lot of this information to some of your rowers you have on the waters on any given day. One final one for you, Connie, just a question about on the concept tour, do you see a little force curve? Uh, I don't know if you've looked at that and, and I've done something similar or used something similar on, on low perfect. Is there enough granularity in that concept to curve? Uh, was a question on the ERG to, to give you some useful information. Of course, it is, um, you know, it gives you sort of good basic understanding how they are, you know, connecting their movement uh, and uh, to the handle. And you can see how they are keeping the connection to that ergometer while moving. So the resolution, of course, is not as high as what we see here with uh, the system, for example, I'm using or um, what we see with most of the on-water systems. However, it is one display you can definitely uh, use for coaching and for training to give a really good visual feedback to the athlete. Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah. yeah, of course, um, it's, it's there. It will look sometimes uh, a little bit different once they're on the water because that um, ergometer technique is different to the uh, on-water technique. We know that um, the ergometer, of course, is much more forgiving in the way we are coming towards the catch or how we finish. So um, people need to be aware of that and discuss that with the athletes. But of course, the information on these displays are 
there to use and they give good feed give good feedback yeah over the years and one thing i would actually recommend to people is and maybe coaches don't always uh, want to do it necessarily publicly is sit on it and and play with it a little bit yourself and and do things you know row with your arms or row with your back and arms and see what it does or uh, build in some errors and actually see well what's the response of that and actually begin to understand the nuances of something like that so that when you do sit an athlete on it you you actually can interpret what's there in front of you because as you say each device has its own nuances and i guess the further you get away from the top end devices the more inference is made uh, around the curve in terms of its accuracy. So uh, yeah, I think all of these tools are, are definitely useful. Uh, I'm always reminded my original training was in engineering was if you measure something, what are you measuring and how repeatable is the measurement? And are you really measuring what you think you're measuring? Uh, so it's, that's always stuck with me. It was one of the first things that was, uh, one of the first strong messages in engineering school was, yeah, you love to put a measurement on something, but understand what it really means, understand how accurate and repeatable it is, and then you can use it. Mm. Otherwise, it may be the wrong measurement for what you're actually trying to figure out. Yeah, and I guess um, that's actually good that you came up to that as well, because what I notice is, and that, that's where I have a lot of discussions currently with, um, with the coaches all over the world is that now where everyone is forced to train pretty much on their own at home and they want to use this information on the ergometers let it be on the c2 or the um the uh, rp3s um they now start to say connie you know where should the peak force be it says you know is it at 44 percent or at 38 percent where does it lie in comparison to the on water uh, um yeah. on the on water technique and i have to say exactly what you mentioned before we need to understand that different companies put different calculations into their systems and into their software so what we we need to actually understand from each of the different companies where they start to take that measurement front. What's their beginning point? Is it their minimum angle? Or is it based on, you know, where is the actual beginning of the stroke for each of the systems? So I'm now actually calling around the different uh, equipment providers to figure out where that all is. So athletes and coaches do not try to recreate strokes of something that is actually just differently calculated in different mm -hmm. equipment. Yeah? Um, yeah. So we need to, we love our numbers, but as you say, we need to understand where the differences lie with different systems we are implementing into our training regime. Understand what it's measuring, understand what it's telling you, don't overuse it, use it as a supporting tool and you'll be on your way, I think is the, is the key message there, yeah? Keep your touch. <laughs> <laughs> Keep yeah. your touch. Connie, thank you so, so much for that. This, this has been our longest webinar by far because- I'm so uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to apologize at all because the content is fascinating and the, the engineer in me always likes to, 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 uh, to look at this information and, and figure out what's, what it's telling me. Connie, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure uh, our viewers appreciated it as well. Um, and maybe there's an opportunity in the future to, to develop this a little bit further. Well, yes, would be nice. And uh, thanks everyone who's listening. And I look forward to your next few webinars. Thank you so much. Connie, thank you very much.